It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. It is the Jill on Money show. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One studios here in New York. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Mark and I were just talking about football. Wow. It's, I, I mean, I picked a good season to get back into the NFL, right? Really just so interesting. Last weekend, I had a crazy experience where I sort of, I tapped into both sides of my personality because I went to a Sunday matinee of La Boheme. Shh, spoiler alert, she dies every time. Uh, and it was fantastic. So, by the way, thank you to the Metropolitan Opera for doing Sunday matinees. So much better. Three hours, I can totally stay up. It's fantastic. It was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Then I come out, go across the street, go to a neighborhood restaurant, sidle up to the bar, look at the score. Kansas City is up, you know, by 20 points. And I say to the bartender, oh, looks like it was a blowout. He said, not so fast. Then I started thinking about sports and even football in general, just to be able to say it is a perfect metaphor sometimes for investing, which is people can tell you, pundits can tell you, they can look at the the numbers, they can give you your uh, various odds of things that might occur. And guess what? Sometimes the unthinkable can happen. And to me, that's a wonderful lesson for all of us. You should check out the website, jillonmoney.com, where I do discuss some of the big risks going into 2020. The biggest risk of them all, I know you know this, but it's you. Look in the mirror. It's you. That's what we learn over and over again. We are our own worst enemies. And so check out that blog post. It's at jillonmoney.com. Just click on the read vertical and there you will find it. If you have a financial question, beginning of the year, getting ready for tax season, why don't you send us an email? The email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. All right, we love to start the program off with a caller. First up is Steve from Massachusetts. Hello, Steve. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. How you doing? Fantastic. What's up? So um, I have a new 401k program at my employment. Mm-hmm. They now offer Roth uh, 401k Great. Uh, in addition to the traditional uh, 401k. And I'm just wondering, what are the benefits? What can I do? All right. So let's go back, Steve. Just roll back the tape and tell me about, number one, how much money do you earn? And then also a little bit about what's going on in your financial life. Sure. Uh, my wife and I are employed by the same company. Mm-hmm. We earn about two hundred thousand dollars a year. We have a total of about one point five million in traditional four hundred one k, and we have no debt. We have two girls, but they're covered by five twenty nine. So financially, we're doing okay. Oh, no mortgage, by the way. Oh, sweet. How old are you guys? I'm fifty five, and my wife's fifty four. Okay, so you're in great shape. Um, and uh. You so you got two girls and uh, anything else? Uh, any other income in the future, or will you be just living? Are you saving to live off of that f- traditional one and a four hundred one k, the one and a half million dollars? Oh, very important point. Uh, I forgot to tell you, we have a traditional uh, defined pension with my employer, and uh, I think we get uh, we're estimating about one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. Whoa, that's a big thing to forget. How much yeah. do you think you need to live on? The mortgage is paid off already. So what would you say is your target? I don't know, maybe eighty, hundred thousand uh, dollars $100,000. We don't live that lavishly, so. Wow. So really, that uh, pension plus future Social Security is going to right. basically float you, right? Yeah. Okay. So the $1.5 million that you have socked away is in and of itself, probably superfluous, but I'm glad you have it. Okay. So now tell me about for you guys, uh, how much money are you putting into the plan right now? Oh, the max amount for both of us, including catch up. All right. So that's good because you're both over 50. 
Um, and do you have any other assets? You have the 401k, the 529 plans. How about money that's sitting in cash? Uh, cash, we have about $50,000. Great. And what and, about non-retirement investments? Oh, uh, we have a brokerage account. That's about uh, $400,000 plus uh, kids for the 529. Okay. That's fantastic. Okay. You made it so easy for me, Steve. I love the idea of you using the Roth. And here's why. You know, you've got this million and a half bucks. It is already sitting in a tax deferred account. So obviously, when you turn 72, because that's the new rule now, it's went from 70 and a half to 72, you will have to start taking money out of that account. So in the meantime, how great would it, would it be for you and your wife to contribute the maximum into the Roth 401k, which would not be subject to required minimum distributions, which you could just let grow for as long as you possibly can. So essentially what would happen, I, I don't know when you guys plan to retire, what what age pro- approximately? Well, I want to retire by the time I'm maybe 60 to 63 and my wife maybe even earlier. Okay, but you'll both have, but when, if if you make it to 60, will you be able to tap the uh, pension plan? Uh, no, no. I have to wait until I think a few years later. Okay. So here's what I think the game plan would be. You use the Roth 401k. You still have the brokerage account, right? When mm-hmm. you retire, you need to fund the difference between what your expenses are and what your you know what what's coming in so depending on when both of you retire maybe maybe you stagger your retirement but you've got to wait for that pension to come in so you would use your brokerage account to pay for those needs coming coming up before you're entitled to the pension right mm-hmm. then yep, yep, w- okay. then yep. when you actually get the pension it doesn't really matter. You probably, you're not going to run out of money, right? So you, you would then have uh, the pension, some social security. Then you would be able to use brokerage account if you wanted to. You might start taking some money out of the retirement account early, depending on what the tax rates are at the time. We'd have to look at it. But the Roth 401k is the last type of asset that you would ever need to access because it's already been taxed. And when you take it out of that account, there would be no tax due. Essentially, that is perhaps like the greatest investment uh, vehicle for anyone to inherit. But that said, it's fine for you to, I say, use the Roth. Don't look back. And, you know, look, obviously you need to be careful about, you know, the way you're investing and that brokerage account specifically. If you're going to need to tap that money before the pension comes in, just be careful not to assume too much risk with it. But I think you're in great shape, Steve. It's uh, it's a fantastic scenario. I got to get me one of those jobs with a pension. Mark, let's get on that. Uh, you are listening to Jill on Money. If you have a financial question, you can get to us a couple of different ways. You can send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Or when you're on our website, jillonmoney.com, there's a contact button in the upper right-hand corner. You can click that. Tell us about yourself. We'd love to have you come join us or just send us an email. Either way. Okay. We will be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. All you have to do, send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. By the way, we have a sister broadcast. It is a podcast. You know, Mark, every so often, I don't know if your parents do this, but every so often my mother will say to me something like this. I don't know how to listen to a podcast. At which point I take her phone out and I remind her, I'm like, hey, you know what? Look at this. This here is a little icon. Uh, It's an app. It's already here on your iPhone. Not for for your Android people. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you from the iPhone perspective. All you have to do. What is a podcast? A podcast 
is like this radio show, but you can listen to it whenever you want to listen to it. So you can get podcasts in lots of different ways. So there are different apps. You can get the podcast on Apple. You can get it on Stitcher. You can get it on Radio.com. You can get it on Google Play. All you have to do is search for Jill on Money. And so we do slightly different con- content for the podcast and the radio show. It's a little bit different. So with the podcast, we do a deep dive in guest, And then we also do a separate podcast, which is just the callers. So it's kind of fun. You should check it out. And if you have a question, I promise you, all you have to do is send us an email. We'll, we'll walk you through how to do it. Wouldn't that be great? I think you should do it. What's wrong, Mark? Okay, Mark is trying to give me information about our caller who's traveling for work. Brendan, uh, I'm looking at your phone number, which Mark sent me, and it makes me think you're from the East Coast. But where are you currently? <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Good morning. Good morning. I I am in Scottsdale for work. <gasps> so. Come on. How nice is it right now? It's beautiful. This sunrise is everything they talk about. Oh, um, boy. And you're calling quite early from Scottsdale, so we appreciate that. Mark is a big fan of Arizona. He went to college there, so uh, you're in his territory. What can I do for you today, Brendan? Thanks, Jill. Um, so, and I love your podcast. Thank uh, you. Now, tomorrow, my wife and I are going to achieve a a goal we set it for ourselves, and we're paying off our our mortgage completely. Woo, we need like a special sound effect, exciting <laughs> uh, bursts of energy. Well, congratulations! How old are you? Thank you. Uh, I'm 37, and my wife is 34. Wow, you're so young to have a paid off mortgage. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, we're boring to a degree. <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> all right. Well, tell me a yeah. little bit more about what you're going to do with all this newfound cash flow. How much money were you paying towards the mortgage, your principal and interest? What was the uh, dollar amount? Oh, monthly, we were looking at like 2800 We did a 15-year and put 20% down. Okay. And then um, I- I'm in – well, I'm in sales, so my income fluctuates. Mm-hmm. Uh and my wife does really well too. And uh, so we would just throw chunks at like, you know, 10K, 20K here or there. And then, you know, towards the end of this year, we were looking at the bottom of it and we thought, well, you know, we pace this out, we'll be able to knock it out in January. That's so. kind of fantastic. So um, are you guys, do you have any kids? Yes, we have a one, one-year-old daughter. Okay. And uh, we would love to have a second one on the way. So um, our daycare monthly is like, 2100 bucks mm. and uh and then i know that you usually ask your callers about monthly expenses and all that so we sat down on sunday and added everything up we're, we're around including vacations or whatever through the year we average our monthly expenses after the mortgage is paid off our average monthly monthly expenses will be around 5k okay and what do you i mean you're in sales so you, again you have variable income but let, let's use a number that you feel comfortable that you know you can kind of reproduce over time you and your wife together what's the income uh, together we can reasonably expect, sorry, I had her numbers in one column of mine and another. That's all right. So I'd say, you know, <clears throat> household 375, 400. Great. You can expect. Oh my God. That's fantastic. How are you guys funding retirement right now? So we're each doing the 401k um we're maxing that out per which is like 19k per year right now 19.5 um, this year you're so excited a little extra money <laughs> yeah okay yeah. and uh my wife is much smarter than i was she would when she would max it out uh she then, then started putting money into an ira um and then when i'm trying to figure out so we're, we're both maxing out our 401k okay. but then now as, as the mortgage payment rolls off mm. We're trying to figure out what's the best vehicle because you, you could I don't want to just throw it in savings. I mean, our, our long term plan is to it's not our forever home. We, we have a nice like starter home. But when you know our daughter's in kindergarten, that's probably where we'll look to move to a different school district. Right. So so maybe, you know, upgrade, you know, and of course, with like the sale of our current home in mind, mm-hmm. um, what are some financial vehicles you recommend in terms of saving our current savings accounts? When you when you do a joint, it's just not. You know, 
the, the percent is just so low. Yeah. So, but we also need that flexibility to um, say if we see something we really like or if something changes with our jobs and we need to move. Yeah. Um, what do you recommend? Like, where do you start putting this, these chunks into each month as, okay. as this mortgage payment rolls so off? So your wife is doing a non-deductible IRA. Is that correct? Because now you make you, you make three hundred seventy-five grand together. That means that you can't use a Roth. So is that is this a non-deductible IRA that she's been funding? Shoot, I can't remember. I'm um, sure it is because she basically, can't. Basically, okay, you would know. <laughs> yeah, she, she, that's fine. Okay, so that's six grand in there. How much do you have in savings right now? Uh, we have 50K. Okay. Current so we got home... a good, like, eight months or so. Okay. Save. And your current home is worth how much? Uh, if we put it on the market today, we could probably get low 600. And if you wanted to upgrade, what would you have to spend? A million? I think in the D.C. area to get what we'd like, uh, we were just talking about this. I mean, originally we thought 1.2, but mm-hmm. probably closer by the time we're ready, closer to 1.5. Okay, got it. And would you be willing to assume a mortgage for that, or are you just hell-bent on never being having a mortgage again? <laughs> I mean, that's a fantasy, but <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, realistically, yeah, we, we would just take on a, a new mortgage, and, and that's totally fine. We'll okay. Do, we'll do a 15-year again, and it would be... You close the gap. I mean, you're looking at maybe 800K, yep. 900. Yep. Okay. How much money is in, you said you're saving for college. How much is in the 529 account? We, you know, you're going to laugh. We, we don't have a 529 set up yet. Ah. Um, is, is there a requirement where the, um, the child would have to be in state for college? No. Or can they go anywhere? You can go anywhere. Okay. I mean, you, do you live in the district right now or do you live in Virginia or Maryland? We're in Maryland. Okay. And then we would probably move in our next home to the district, in which case I think that opens you up to any school that you can count as in-state tuition, right? Yeah, and I don't think you really even need to worry so much. I mean, from a 529 First of all, you should be using a 529 plan. Um, you can go to savingforcollege.com. You can check out some of the different plans. Some of the best 529 plans that are not state-specific, meaning that you don't have to – some of them – some states give you an in-state tax-deductible credit or deduction for using the plan. Others don't. But some of the best 529 plans that have nothing to do with your state – Nevada, Utah, Alaska, Maryland actually has a very good plan. So I think that um, those are good options. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the way to move forward. You're in fantastic shape. Really good. I want to talk about how much money you already have in your 401k accounts, how much money is in your wife's IRA. And then we're going to talk about the best way to move forward in terms of investing, which vehicles make sense for you, how to be tax efficient, because you obviously are in a bad tax bracket. And um, we'll get you going. It's sort of like phase two of your life. So stay tuned because we are coming back. This is so exciting. Tomorrow, his mortgage is paid off. That's got to feel good, huh? I'd like to experience that someday. Mark says he'll never know it. He loves leveraging money. Okay, it's Jill on money. When we return, we're going to get back to this very burning question. In the meantime, go check out our website, jillonmoney.com. There you can buy my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Before we went to the break, we were talking to Brendan, who's paying off his mortgage. Going to have some free cash flow. Want to figure out what to do with it. We already know you're going to open a 529 account. So let's ask a few more questions. So how much money have you already saved in your 401k accounts? Uh, so we have, I got 150 or 155 actually. And then, uh, my wife for 401k is 270. She has a IRA with about 50 K in it. And then an employee stock ownership program, which is actually real money. It's not just options. Uh, and that's, there's about 20 K in that. Okay. Great. And no non-retirement fund, right? 
just just retirement assets, right? Yeah, we're we're not in the stocks at all. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have two K in, in savings for our one year old. Okay. So far, and we right. d- we would like to go for a second. Um, in which case, I don't know. Maybe you would recommend starting something now. Um, well, but listen, we just have the one savings plan for the little one. First of all, you got to get busy. I know one thing. If you want to have a child, there are things you need to do. Then we'll talk about how to fund that kid's education. Um, so, so okay. first of all, um, you have this free cash flow that's going to be created. You're going to have the money from the mortgage. Now we have to figure out where to put it. I would say mm-hmm. this. I love the idea that you're both maxing out your retirement accounts. you got to keep doing that. I think what you next need to do is probably open something, just a plain old brokerage account. Now, I, where is your wife's IRA held? Do you know what, what investment company holds that? Uh, Fidelity. Okay. So what you can do is you can open up a joint brokerage account at Fidelity. All right? And from that account, you can put anything you want in it. So this is going to be, think of this just as a big holding tank for all of your non-retirement or call it even supplemental retirement needs. And the way I might start it is I might just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a little bit of money from my savings account just so I can open up the account. And maybe you would just put in a couple of index funds. Maybe you'd take an extended market index fund and a bond index fund. And then every month from that $2,800 that you have available, maybe you would put a thousand into the stock fund, a thousand in the bond fund, and then take eight hundred bucks and put it into the five twenty nine that you're going to open, and just mm. like that, and get it automatic and get the money moving. Now, why would I take less risk with that brokerage account? Because you may need that money, right? You may find that, you know, you say, oh well, you know, my current house is worth six hundred. Well, what if in three years, all of a sudden? The housing market presents an opportunity to you and you want to grab Mm -hmm. it and you say, I'm going to liquidate some of this money and I'm going to use my house equity and some of this other money to buy this new house. So I think that what the joint account does is it buys you flexibility. The thing that I want you to think to to remember about the 529 asset, though, is that is a the most efficient investing you can do. Meaning that for your kids, if they go to college, presuming they will, that that money will come out with zero tax due. So Mm. if you put in $800 a month or 800, you know, just for the sake of argument right now, and that grows to $50,000 by the time your young, your daughter goes to college, when you sell that, that asset and you use it to pay tuition, there's no tax due. Whereas when you save in the brokerage account and you sell, there is a tax due. So I think it's I, – I, I really know that, that you've got a, a lot of different things that are moving here. That's why I would put more of the money in the joint account. If you were – if you said, I'm staying in this house forever, what should I do? I would put even more money in the 529. But because you might need some of this money, I think it makes sense for you to build up this non-retirement asset. Yeah, yeah, we talked about passing on something if there was an attractive place that opened up in a few years. So yeah. that flexibility is nice. Yeah, and I think um, that that's all you really need to think about going forward. And <laughs> how much do you think college is going to cost 17 years from now? I mean, if you were to guess, what well, are we looking at? put it this way. If you look at the – Mark, what did you do for um, the, the – you, Mark ran these numbers just recently. All right, so if you look at 50 or 60 grand a year today for private university – you can apply any inflation rate to that. It's insane. OK. Yeah. But just look at it as that. And you can go on to savingforcollege.com. You can use that calculator. It almost doesn't matter because you're going to have plenty of money. I don't I don't think that you're young and, you know, you've got now, obviously, 17 years to look at. Um, and, and if you have two kids, chances are, you know, kind of depending on what you do with the sec with the next home, you almost could pay this out of cash flow. You know, there is a possibility that that you could. But I think what is most prudent is to say we don't know what's going to happen. We're going to save some money and, you know, hope for the best. Hope that one of your kids is a screw up and doesn't go to college. No, I'm just kidding. You hope for the best. (laughs) You know, you listen, let's say that you're living in Virginia 
right? And sure. y- and you say, oh, my God, my daughter can get into UVA. That's a huge savings for you, right, because you're in-state. And you don't know what college is going to be in 17 years. We don't know what's going to happen. But I like this game plan of sort of having the availability of different pots of money to fund the the various things that you wish to fund in the future. I think that what's, you know, what's very clear is that you're good savers. Keep saving. Set up that brokerage account. Only use low-cost index funds. As more money, as more money goes into that account, what I think is really uh, going to help you out is to know that you can add different asset classes. You feel free to get back in touch with us when that time occurs. And if you have any follow-up questions as you're navigating this, give us a shout. Just send us a note. And um, I wish you the best of luck. Congratulations on paying off the mortgage. And we will look forward to hearing from you in the future, Brendan. But well done. Brendan woke up early in Scottsdale to call us. That's amazing. He may not have. It could have been a crazy night in Scottsdale for all we know. If you are like Brendan, you want to run some of these numbers. You've got different um, ideas about what to do in the future, short term, intermediate, long term. And you want to juggle this? Just let us know. We can try to help you out. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. During the break, go onto the website, JillOnMoney.com. You can subscribe for our free weekly newsletter. It is free, and we would absolutely love to hear from you and have you tell us what you want to include on that newsletter. All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And, uh, oh, my God, I'm so psyched. When is Ed Slot coming in? When's that happening? Going to get a special guest star, Ed Slot, back in the studio so we can talk more about the SECURE Act. In the meantime, if you have questions about that pa- the passage of that brandy new uh, change in retirement law, retirement saving and withdrawals, go to the website jillonmoney.com. I think I asked the question, will the SECURE Act rescue retirement? That's the question. Anyway, there's so much in there. Uh, so uh, give us a shout if you have questions about that as well. All right. And as always, you can send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's what Anna did. Here is the question. Hi, Jill. I know you know it all. I so don't, but thank you for saying that. Um, As I sort through the papers from my parents' estates, I found stock certificates from the years 1962 and 1971. They show 1,000 of 1,000 shares of one stock, 100 shares of the other. Where is a reliable place to search their worth? My parents weren't wealthy, nor am I, so I would hope there would be an economical company for stock with an unknown value. Thanks in advance. Well, here's a question. Um, Maybe you could just kind of try to deposit those shares into a brokerage account. Maybe just by opening an account, you might be able to do that. Obviously, just do a search of the company itself to see if the company is still in business. That would be a good place to start. Um, and uh, But if you were to open up an account, say, at Charles Schwab or at uh, any brokerage house, just you know, make sure it's a discount broker. You try to deposit the shares. Then they'll figure out what those shares are worth. They could be worthless. Who knows? But it's worth a shot. Those old stock certificates, mm, it's like the double E bonds of the equities markets. Like you just got to do a little research, give it a shot, and let us know how you fare. Hopefully it goes okay for you. It's uh, interesting to think about the how paper has simply disappeared from our lives when it comes to investing. Isn't it amazing? I think at least. Okay. Uh, here's from Leslie who's divorced and says, she writes, I'm 74 years old. My financial advisor of many years recently died 
and his son, who's in his 30s, has taken over advising me. Okay, so the son has continued his father's advice that I will need to work. She's 74. Hmm. She writes, I have medical issues, hip surgeries, and back problems, and I don't see returning to work as an option. I'm looking for financial advice as well as guidance with my investments. Could you get back to me about this? Well, Leslie, I mean, I don't know if they, um, I need to know more about you. How about that? Let's start with that. Um, maybe could you do some sort of part-time work from home, whether that be uh, call center stuff, working remotely, maybe that's a possibility. But what I'd really like to know is what money do you have invested? How about that? That's number one. Number two, what is the source of your income right now? I presume social security. And we just need to know more about you because otherwise I can't give you good advice. Uh, Okay, here is a question from Neil. He says, my wife recently made partner in her company. Woo-hoo! That was me. I don't think he wrote woo-hoo. She is eligible for a profit-sharing plan. Leading up to this, we have both been investing the maximum amounts in our 401k and 403b plans. With our current finances, we could probably afford to make the maximum contribution with a profit-sharing plan and her 401k, which is at about uh, of about $57,000. Is there a benefit to using the money provided to her through a paycheck rather than having it placed into a profit-sharing plan? Kind of depends on what else is going on in your life. Here's um, what I would want to know. I would want to know how old you are, how much money you have outside of profit sharing, and what your tax bracket is right now. Because with that information, we can make a better uh, estimate. Here's the thing. For so much of our work lives, probably until two years ago, we were preconditioned to try to put as much money away pre-tax as humanly possible. That's kind of in your brain. I get it. But since the tax law changed in the beginning of 2018, what we come to learn is that some of us may be better off not putting away money pre-tax. Some of us may be better off paying taxes today and making sure that money is already been taxed and have the use of that money because maybe we're worried about what would happen in the future, right? Now, for most people, if you're, I don't know, I'm just going to kind of put it out there. If you're a partner in this firm and you are, you know, making a lot of money, you still may want to get that money out of your taxes, out of your taxable income, because it makes sense. But really, this is such a personal decision now that is that brings together where you stand today, how much longer you think you're going to work, what other assets have been put, put aside so many moving pieces to it. So I'd love for you to send a little more information and that way we could help guide you uh, a little bit more precisely. So if you have that, that would be great. Okay. Now for everyone else, we need information from you. We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And if you're on the website at jillonmoney.com, you can read, listen, watch, check out our resources and you know, sign up for that free weekly newsletter. Do it all. It's at our website, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Before we finish up the hour, we want to do some email business. Also want to remind you that we are broadcasting live from the Capital One Studios here in New York City. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Answer that question. I always know what's in my wallet. I'm obsessive about that. I know that's shocking. (laughs) Mark's laughing. This is your good giggle of the morning, Mark. All right, Justin writes... Thank you for being my playlist on my daily walks. I <sighs> love that. I have learned a ton from your show. You give such sound advice. I'm wondering if you could throw some my way. I'm 28, single. I make about $150,000 a year. My mom owns, owns the house I live in, but we worked out a strange deal. 
where she took out a home equity line of credit and it has essentially turned into my quote unquote mortgage. So the HELOC home equity line of credit is for $255,000. The interest rate is four and a quarter percent. My main question is how aggressively should I pay off the HELOC versus how aggressively should I invest? I've been contributing the max to one of my employer's 403B plans over the past few years. My other job has a state-provided pension plan. This guy is 28 years old and single. I'm about to set him up with my niece with that kind of deal. All right. No other debts except a monthly car payment. I'm wondering where I should be directing any extra money every month. I thought I would plan to pay off the HELOC in about 10 years. Should I take anything else or start an IRA or non-retirement account or should I put all the money towards the HELOC? Any help is greatly appreciated. It's interesting, and I'll tell you why. Mom owns the house and mom has the home equity line of credit. So it's really an issue around mom a little bit because I'd love to know more about mom's situation. Um, You don't get the write-off of the interest on the home equity line of credit she would. Um, I would generally say, unless she's hurting for the money, I might take the extra money and just put a uh, put together an investment account, a non-retirement investment account. That's what I would try to do. Um, but if there's something different about mom's financial situation we need to know about, then you do let me know. Okay, one last question before we go. Frank wants to know, is there a time of year where I should consider buying a mutual fund? Frank, no, there's no time of year, except don't do it at the end of the year, right before they distribute their um, their their annual taxable distributions. Okay, that's it for hour one. If you've got a financial question, ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Stay tuned. We've got a great guest coming right up. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. You are back. It's our number two. So exciting. We're broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius. It is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Go to policygenius.com. Uh, I did the most fun segment this past week on CBS This Morning. Uh, I I interviewed two guys who are roommates. It's like, remember the Golden Girls, Mark? Yeah, yeah. gives that a big thumbs up. This is like the Golden Boys. Um, They're um, roommates. And uh, it was really interesting because there is this organization in New York City where they facilitate a process where they can vet roommates and senior roommates and put people together. And it's kind of cool. So, um, Mark, we should put a link to the um, segment in the show notes because uh, these two gentlemen, Paul and Jim, it's so cool because what ended up happening is that obviously it always turns into something a little bit more than just a financial arrangement. But I will say that You know, for each of them, it turned out to be a really smart financial decision. And I think that when you look at the number of of seniors who were going into their retirement financially insecure, it's pretty unbelievable. Really, it's startling. So in preparing for the segment, I also was interested because I um, looked at this recent survey from Boston College. They have this great resource called the Retirement Resource Center, I think, or something like that. Anyway, they found half of today's working families are at risk of not being able to maintain their standard of living once they retire. Isn't that amazing? It is hard to make up for lost ground. Um, One thing that's really interesting in the analysis is that the percentage of households at risk would be cut by more than a third if people delayed retirement just by two years from 65 to 67. That is because if you do that, you're obviously not dipping into your savings, but you're also able to increase 
your monthly Social Security benefits. Okay, that's a lot of time to talk about one thing. Let's get to our guest. He is my friend, return guest, Chris Gillibo. He's the author of The $100 Startup and a new book called 100 Side Hustles. Let's get into your side hustling. Here's my interview with Chris Gillibo. So you also had the $100 startup. Mm -hmm. And so what was the genesis of that? Genesis of that was, um, you know, I did this 50-state tour uh, to meet my readers for my first book, which was so fun, so good, learned lots of stuff along the way. And uh, I kept meeting all of these, like, quote-unquote, accidental entrepreneurs. And they were starting little businesses uh, of their own, completely separate from like the Silicon Valley model and all the other stuff that was being talked about in terms of entrepreneurship. And I felt nobody was really writing about them, basically. I felt like there's this whole different like part of the country, part of the ethos, et cetera, that the conversation that nobody's really looking at. And so let me tell those stories, you know. And that was very much like the $100 startup was very much like a quit your job, fire your boss, you know, create your own future kind of book. Um, and, and that was good. Like I'm, I'm proud of it. But you know, over the years, it's kind of like, well, a lot of people can't quit their job. And also, not everybody is the kind of person who should quit their job. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, I've got great benefits. Yep. I got a couple kids. I don't want to, like, sure. take this flyer. Or I myself don't feel like that's something I want to do. Like, I really, I enjoy my work or Absolutely. I like my work. Absolutely. So let's talk about the distinction. Hmm. Because there's a side hustle, mm-hmm. which it may be different than a gig. Like being part of the gig economy, yeah, versus hugely different, right? And so let's start there. Yeah, how would you compare? Because you do this really well in the book, the side hustle versus participating in the gig economy. Well, the gig economy is just a collection of part-time jobs, basically, um, dressed up as some kind of like new economy sort of thing. And nothing wrong with having a part-time job, you know. Like everybody has to do that at some point in life. But if you participate in that, if you're driving for Uber or Lyft or whatever, you're not really getting ahead at all. You know, you're you're trading time for money and not even a whole lot of money. And also they control everything about that process. That platform controls everything. They cap your compensation. They determine the competition. If they don't like you, you're off the platform, et cetera. So you're not really building any sort of, of asset or future for yourself. And so most of the stories that I look at, like through the Side Hustle School podcast or through this new book, it's about people who are creating assets. So a side hustle different than a gig. And and I think that that's a good distinction about control. There mm. is something about that what I put in is what I can get out and yes. that I can choose to turn it on and turn it off. So mm-hmm. maybe that's one distinction. What other distinctions might you have? Well, I mean, that kind of connects to like a sense of ownership, a sense of validation, of empowerment, of like I made this thing. And what I see is like even people that are making like relatively small amounts of money through this process, $500 a month or $1,000 a month. I mean, first of all, it's, it's not insignificant. Right. That's your car payment or it's going toward your student loan debt or whatever. But even so, it's like disproportionately satisfying making this money apart from your paycheck because you wake up and you have like a PayPal payment from a stranger or something. And you're like, I, you know, somebody sent me money like on, on the Internet and it's not fraudulent, you know. Um, it's not going to go back to them, I don't think, right? You know, it's actually going to go into my my bank account. So the, so the thing is, for, you know, for a lot of us, like we are used to that. Like that's our world as entrepreneurs. But for the average person out there, the first time they have that experience, it just feels really good. When I open the book and I, I'm reading about these stories, these are people who you highlighted on the podcast, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And so what about their stories do you think connects them? Well, I try to present like a broad range of stories. So it's like all kinds of different stuff. So there are people from different walks of life doing all kinds of different projects. I think what connects them is they have this sense of, uh, of asking, what if? You know, what if I could make money doing this thing? What if this wasn't just a hobby, but it actually could be something that's, you know, bringing me income? So they ask what if. They have the sense of curiosity that they develop. Uh, and then they actually do something about it. So that's the other thing, right? Because everybody has ideas. You know, the average person on the street has a business idea. Great, but the average person isn't actually starting the project. So they have this sense of curiosity and observation, and they're willing to, like, take the next step, whatever it is. They don't go back to business school. Like, not, I mean, I've had 900 episodes, you know, of the show so far, maybe, like, five people that have an MBA or something. And in most of those stories, they always talk about how they have to, like, overcome what they learned in business, you know. <laughs> right. Like, that was a mistake, but then I learned how to really do it, you know, so. And I think the range is fascinating to me because these are people in all different parts of their lives. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what's inspirational because, you know, we can just, like, open up the book yeah. to, to, to any page, mm-hmm. right? And we can say, here's someone who's crafty, some dude in New Zealand. Right. We can go over here and we can say, here's, you know, handcrafted wallets. 
I remember that when we were talking the first time, you said, you know, like there's a guy who's like, hey, I'm really good at spreadsheets. Let me do spreadsheets right, right, for right. you. Right. So I'm, I'm taking something I do at work and applying right. it to a vast majority of people who don't want to do that thing. Right. This feels different. Mm. How, how well, do you find of, that? I think there's some of both. I think, uh, you know, it's often good for your side hustle to be something different than what you do, you know, for your day job. But it can be an extension. So that guy was like making these spreadsheet courses, essentially. So it's a skill, but it's applied a little bit differently. I mean, there's the people that are doing, you know, administrative computer kind of work. And so then they do the hands on thing at night. Um, but there's also like a story, like a reverse story of a guy who he was a graphic designer and then he became a carpenter. because He's like, I really actually want to do that. So he became a carpenter for his day job. And now his side hustle is making these like travel patches, um, you know, that go on backpacks or whatever. But he actually wanted to do more computer work for his side hustle because it was the opposite. We'll get back to our interview with Chris Gillibo in just a second. How about during the break? Just go onto the website and noodle around a little bit. There's so much there. Maybe you want to watch that segment I referenced in the beginning of the hour. Do it. Just click on the watch vertical. The little button. Watch all my TV segments coming right up right there. Okay, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Woo! We are talking to my friend Chris Gillibo. You may have heard him on the program, uh, I don't know, Mark, a couple years ago maybe? I think maybe a couple years ago it's been. I met him. By the way, the guy walks into the studio. I pretty much fell in love with him on the spot. It was amazing. Uh, And I love him. I love his story. I love the way that he breaks down this concept of how to actually do something on the side, alongside maybe your career or do something that really nourishes you in some way. Maybe it is, uh, maybe it's something you love to do, like you love to bake and you're going to do that. Maybe it's something you're really good at at work. You know, I remember in um, in the book, when, when I first met him, he was talking about his book Side Hustle and he was talking about how, you know, there are people who do things that it comes so naturally to them at work and they can use that as their little side gig, their their second job or a little extra income. So, you know, like if let's say, for example, Mark decided that instead of just living in Jill on money world, that he wanted to do some other stuff. Maybe he could edit other people's podcasts. Maybe he could produce other shows, something that comes so naturally to him. He might be able to explore using that on the side, doing something else. Uh, He says never, but that I don't believe. Anyway, how do you bring this idea from thought to execution? That's something that Chris is really good at. So here's more of our interview with Chris Gillibo. So if you think about like sort of the the person who thinks about a side hustle, Mm. what has to happen from thought to execution? So first they have this idea and they're like, how do I go from idea to actually having a tangible offer of some kind, right? Like, hey, I like to travel. All I right. wonder what it would be like to go to every single country in the world. Sure. So how does that, what does that look like? How many countries are there in the world? You know, what are going to be the difficult ones? How can I group them together? What's the cost? What visa issues am I going to run into? How much time will this take? Just reverse engineering the process. I mean, there's this story um, of this guy in this book who um, is a copywriter for the U.S. Marine Corps, and he makes teddy bears um, dressed up with, like, Marine uniforms and Army uniforms. It's to help kids sleep at night. You know, a lot of military families are buying them, uh, especially with uh, parents who are deployed. So this guy, you know, he didn't have a master's degree in teddy bears. You know, he reverse engineered the process. How do I do that? Well, how do I manufacture. Okay, how do I, where do I find the factory that does this, and how do I import them, and how to distribute them? And how do I market them? And it, you know, in some ways it it sounds overwhelming, but at the same time, like you can figure out everything. The other piece of it to me in reading it Mm. is that it takes you out of your routine Mm -hmm. and allows you to really put your arms around something that sounds fun. And even if you determine, yeah, you know what, this is not the best idea because there's these issues, these hurdles, I can't do it. It does start to get you thinking. And so my question is, what can we do to help spark that creativity? Mm. What can we do? People are listening here yep, yep, and yep. they're like, 
This sounds so great. So what do I do? Yeah. Um, a lot of what I do to spark the curiosity is telling all these stories and showing people like all these broad examples of regular people out there, uh, again, who don't have this background or whatever, and they were able to do it. And so maybe you can take this, this particular idea and do this idea yourself, or maybe this idea leads you to something else, or maybe by hearing these stories or reading the book, you know, looking at the, the photographs, maybe that also, that kind of teaches you to think in this way, in this way of like the what if thinking, the curiosity, the you know, how can I then go from, from where I am now to where I want to be? And it's ultimately not, not about learning new skills for the most part. It's learning how to apply the skills that you already have. You say that the perfect trifecta for a side hustle is passion, skills, mm -hmm. and opportunity. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. I think it's more important actually to follow your skills because it's going to just make it much easier to have um, you know, a business idea that can be validated, that other people value, et cetera. But uh, we also tend to be passionate about the things that we're good at. You know, so I think if you focus on your skills, it's going to connect to passion one way, and then, then it's all about where is the right opportunity. You know? When you think back on these 900 episodes and yeah. all the different people you meet, mm -hmm. what percentage, and I won't hold you to this, but what oh. percentage do you think turn the side hustle into their main job or their main career? 36.8%. Stop it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It probably is about a third. Yeah. It probably actually is now that I think about it. Um, and not everybody has that goal, right? right. Some people uh, like, you know, just want to make extra money. They want to pay off debt. Uh, or there are a number of people actually who have a side hustle that's actually earning a really good you know, amount of money, but they choose to stay with their job. But I would say, yeah, it's probably about a third and it's a really good place to be in when you come to this point of like people always ask, they're really worried about this, about like, what do I do once my side hustle really takes off and I'm making all this money? I'm like, well, that's a terrible problem. Right, right? exactly. You know? Oh, too bad. You know, like it's like, how do I pay the taxes on all the money that I made? I'm like, OK, well, you know, you could not make the money and not have that problem. But so when people come to this point, it's like that's when they navigate and make that choice for themselves. And it's like, why are you doing this? What's important? What are your values? What are your goals, et cetera? Do you keep in touch with people? To yeah, a lot of them. Hear. So how yeah. does that work? Tell yeah, me. I mean, a lot of them actually will like send us updates and things, which is fun. And, and uh, for me, probably one of the best things is now that we've been doing this for you know two and a half years, uh, about 20 to 30 percent of the stories on the podcast come from listeners who have started their projects since the podcast started, you know, and they heard an idea and they kind of jumped off from that. So I really like that. I mean, that makes me happy. When you think about those people, mm -hmm. um, d does it break demographically one way or another? I mean, no, it, no? it's just really no. like spread out. It's yeah. a 20 year old to an eight year old, yep. right? This is a values based thing. You know, this is a, a, this is about psychographics. This is about people who are interested in change and interested in doing something for themselves. And maybe they're a little bit discontented or frustrated with their situation or just the status quo or Whatever, so no, it's not. It's not a demographic thing. What are the, the the precautions that you would warn people about? I think people feel like they need to learn everything, which is not possible, and they feel like they need to be on every social network, which is not possible, and ultimately they're just going to spread themselves too thin. And there's so many shiny objects out. Should I be doing webinars? What about the Facebook ads? What about Snapchat? Do I do this? And like, actually, somebody sent me a LinkedIn invitation. And in his, in his bio, he was something about, like, he said, I'm, I'm active on 60 different networks or something. Brother. And I'm like, I can't even name 60 networks. I mean, like 15 maybe. Like, I'm sure they're, how, it's not possible to do that. I think it's really important to focus, especially if you're doing this in limited time, which can be a benefit because when your time is limited, you have mm -hmm. to be effective. You can't try 10 different things at once. You have to just really focus on something. So be on two networks, you know, be on two platforms. And if you if you hate Facebook, then don't be on Facebook. There's other ways to do it. How do you feel about people who they want to do a side hustle and they have partnerships? Do you find that those are more complicated than those that Way are solo? Way more complicated. Yeah, Way let's talk about that. So it's kind of like the life mission thing. Like if you have a really clear reason to have a partnership, and you know, or really, like this is what you want to do. Yeah, maybe you have complementary skills, like this person does one thing, this person does something else, then that's great. But otherwise, like probably on the show, we've had uh, X number of partnership stories, but whatever the number is, it's pretty small. Mm. And then also far more stories of a project that started as a partnership. And then they yep. broke up. Yeah, because inevitably, even with your best friend, inevitably one of you is going to be more committed to the project than the other. Right. That's what happens. Is a side hustle a mm -hmm. luxury that is afforded to people of means? No, I think it's a necessity for everyone. And I think a lot of people out there are experiencing anxiety and, and economic uncertainty. 
And so they understand they need to do something to look out for themselves because no corporation or startup or, or government or organization is, is going to care for their well-being as much as they will. I mean, I would say you know, a, lot, you know, a lot of people that we've featured don't come from a, a privileged background. And this side hustle, which can often become a business, um, you know, can transform their whole life. Just did a story of this family in, in like Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They really didn't have a lot of money. And he was driving for Uber at night trying to like pay extra bills and care for their kids and stuff. And they ended up um, learning to make soap and uh, started this thing on Instagram, really figured out this community and like hacked the algorithm. And they're making tens of thousands of dollars a month all of a sudden. Oh, my God. And it's completely changed their whole family's life. Like, obviously, you know, and I even if it goes away one day, you know, even if it's like the algorithm changes or whatever, you know, first of all, they've, they've been doing this for a little while now, seven months, and it's like a lot of money. And then second, like the skills that they're gaining through this process, the experience that they're gaining. I feel like this is something that actually you know, has the chance to like um, create more of a level playing ground as opposed to the opposite. Okay, we will get back to our final segment with Chris Gillibo. During the break, here's something that you can do. Why don't you go to the IRS website and make sure you've withheld enough money? Huh? Come on, do it. IRS.gov. It's very easy. Withholding calculator. Do it now. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You are back. It's Jill on Money. And uh, we're in the uh, concluding stage of our interview with Chris Gillibo. He is the author of The $100 Startup, 100 Side Hustles, Side Hustle. I think he's got got a lot of um, permutations on a similar theme. What is it that differentiates a gig versus a side hustle. I think the gig is usually like the boring, horrible thing you just do for money. I think the the cool thing about a side hustle is that it can often bring you these really cool benefits. It can make you feel like you're exploring a creative side of your life. And in many respects, according to Chris Gillibo, it can give you a much broader sense of control over your work life, that you don't feel beholden so much to just your your day job. So in the concluding part of our interview with Chris Gillibo, we are going to talk a little bit more about why that side hustle can be so important in our lives. I think what's interesting is that the sense of control is huge to me. Mm-hmm. And I think that when people feel like they are in control of even just one sliver of their lives because Mm -hmm. life is messy. It's hard, right? Mm -hmm. And if I can just do this and I feel in control, and even if, as you said, it doesn't have to be a ton of money, but, you know, if you really consider this, if if the average household in the United States makes fifty or Mm $60,000 and there is some way that you can find a few hundred bucks every single month, Mm -hmm. That actually is a big difference. Yeah. And that can mean the difference yep. between you being able to pay down that student loan debt yep. much faster. Right, it right. might be the difference between your just your head being mm-hmm. a little bit clearer and maybe do you think that perhaps this makes them better at their day jobs? Well, sometimes it does. Right? Sure, yeah. Sometimes That's it what does. I would think. Yeah. Because I think that the idea of exploring something creatively mm-hmm. opens you up to different experiences and opens the door for you to maybe have a different idea at work. And I think one of the mm-hmm. the problems that I hear about all the time from people who work in these you know, big companies is that the idea of innovation and creativity has is talked about but not practiced. Right, right, right. And so where can you find that in your mm-hmm. life? And boy, it feels good when you find that, right? Yeah. And it's exciting. Yeah. It can also make you um, not just do a better job at work. It can make you more valuable at work as well. You know, it was actually in the last book that I had the story of this woman who created this business of like personalized candy hearts. And she really did very well with it. It's like a hundred thousand dollar a year business, um, but it's it's extremely seasonal, and everything happens around Valentine's Day. So she kept her her day job and, and enjoyed that. But they actually gave her a raise at a certain point. They they found out what she's doing, and it, obviously it's totally fine. But they were worried about losing her, you know. Oh, that's and that's funny. So they gave her a raise. So she's obviously doing well in all parts of the equation. What do you feel like is the you know, kind of like you're learning. If you could go back to, you know, your 20-something self, right? Mm. And you're like in West Africa doing yeah. whatever you're doing. What was it that you really thought you were so sure about in your 20s that now 
you wish you could have given the gift to yourself? Mm. It would be some sort of um, emotional confidence or some sort of um, more belief in myself uh, or like self-awareness. Um, it would it'd be something like that. I don't quite know exactly how to how to define it. That's one aspect of it. And the other aspect would be like, hey, you know, a whole bunch of exciting stuff is going to happen, you know, over the next 10, 20 years. Get ready and jump right in and, you know, don't wait, basically. And whenever you, whenever an opportunity comes along that scares you, say yes. So what do you do for yourself to continue mo- motivating yourself? And what do you do f- to spark inspiration? I do new projects. I do new stuff. I, I What's challenging? You know, I think for me, like one of the definitions of like happiness or contentment or meaning or whatever is striving, challenging myself. I'm not, if I don't feel challenged in some way, then I'm not growing. And I think that you kind of stagnate if you're not in that situation. I think it's so, so important. And this is like the giving up thing. People are told that you have to focus and you have like, the, you have to just do one thing. Maybe ultimately that's an answer for a lot of people. But when you're 21 or 25 or whatever the age is, how do you know what the one thing is? Like right. the way that you find out is by doing a bunch of different things. If you're really trying to like break into something or start a business or whatever, why wouldn't you just say yes to everything that comes along? And then as you need to filter, then you can later. And I think what's interesting about that is I know that this generation, so let's think about workers who are in their 20s mm. right now. I feel bad for them because, you know, younger to middle age millennials who came of age during a financial crisis Mm -hmm. and a great recession and there is great financial and economic uncertainty Mm -hmm. and so so many of them seem to be pushing through on a pathway Mm -hmm. that they feel they must be on well you know i've got this debt i have to be able to pay it off Mm -hmm. i have to do this and this is how i get from a to b to c and i think that many of the people that are most interesting to me that I meet mm. are the ones that zigzag. Like I went to A, then I went to M, yep, then I went to exactly. D, and then I went to Z, and that's kind of where I got where I am. Yep, yep. I sort of, I'm sad for them that they don't want to kind of amble. Yeah. I mean, most successful people and, you know, successful being defined as they're fulfilled, they're doing something that they want to do, and other people can look and recognize that excellence in them. I think most successful people have ambled. I often encounter, so I'm in my 50s, right? So I encounter my friends, my family, some of my coworkers who seem kind of just fried. Mm. They are incredibly successful people, right, right. right? From the outside, but they are disgruntled or mm-hmm. I think they're just burnt out in some respects. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Right? And so I think that developing a side hustle at that point could be fantastic. Also, because, you know, we're living longer and doing something and being productive and feeling ambitious and striving. Mm -hmm. I think those are really nurturing and I think Mm -hmm. they're life affirming. And I think that, you know, when I hear about people say, I'm just going to retire when I'm 61 and play golf, I just, I worry. I Mm -hmm. worry for them. Yeah, no, for sure. I don't know if we talked about my grandfather last time I was here. He was a merchant marine and then worked uh, in NASA in the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, for 20 years and had a career. And they had a mandatory retirement thing. I forget it was. I think it was actually before he was 60 even. And he lived 30 more years. And he wasn't always that happy. Mm-hmm. And he didn't do a whole lot. Mm. And, you know, the rest of us in the family, I mean, he's, he's passed on now, but the rest of us, when we've reflected on him, we're like, he could have had a whole other career. He yes. really could have. But at that time, you know, it was like you're just supposed to retire and do, you know, stuff. But right. he could have done something. He was still still at like the prime of his intelligence and faculties when he had to retire. And so, yeah, I wish he had done that. So, yeah. And that's so interesting because I really believe yeah. that we are not meant to be idle. Mm-hmm. We are just not. 100% agree. Thanks so much to Chris Gillibo. We'll link up to all of his great stuff. Uh, he is a good friend of mine, and so I encourage you to check out all of his books. And now, more about us. Just go to JillOnMoney.com during the break, and you can check out all the different resources we've compiled for you. If you've got a good financial tool or resource, be sure to send it to us so we can add it to our resource list. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Oh, doesn't it seem like January just goes on forever? I mean, it's rough, but hey, 
the alternative is a little bit more daunting. So let's just keep going. (laughs) This is the program that tries to take the mystery out of your financial life. And if you've got a financial question, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We always get a slew of notes from those of you who are reading my Tribune column all over the country. And so I thank you so much for those of you who actually do read it and for those of you who take the time to write. Steve saw an artic- my, one of my articles um, last year in Newsday, Long Island newspaper, and says, I'm considering instituting a Roth 401k feature in my company's current 401k plan. Now, this was in response to the backdoor Roth 401k, which I'll explain in a second. Um, So Steve says, I've got some young employees who might be better off with a Roth 401k than a traditional. So that's a very good reason to do it. Really good. And he uh, also writes, he says, from reading your article, it looks like higher earners who are already maxing out their contributions to a traditional 401k and they make too much money to contribute additional after-tax monies to a backdoor Roth um, that if I make this uh, available to them, the earnings on the amount would grow tax-free forever as opposed to putting the money into taxable accounts. Are there any restrictions on being able to implement this strategy? I don't fully understand it, and I was hoping for a more specific explanation. Okay, so... uh, this is a bigger one. By the way, Mark, did we find out about Mega um, Roth from a listener? I think we did. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I where when I wrote about this. So stand by for one second while I, I do a quick lookup of the actual column here. Um, when did I do this, Mark? Do you remember? Okay, so I wrote about the mega backdoor Roth conversion when I was talking about open enrollment. Um, And it was so interesting because we learned about the mega backdoor Roth from one of you. I didn't know a lot about it. And then I did some seminars and webinars with Salesforce, and they have this feature that's available. Okay, so here's how it works. Um, Let's say you make too much money to qualify for a Roth contribution. OK, so if for, for people who make too much money to qualify for a Roth contribution, there's something called a backdoor Roth, which is you make an after tax contribution into an IRA and then you immediately convert it into a Roth IRA. And what happens with a mega backdoor Roth is that it's it allows for a slightly different permutation of that. Let's say you've got a 401k at work and it, you have um after-tax contributions to get more money into a Roth. Um, this is basically a way for Steve to basic to to create steps where you can have an in-service rollover to a Roth IRA or move the after-tax portion of a regular retirement account 401k contribution into a Roth plan. Now, The reason why this is going to sound so crazy is that this just has so many moving parts. So this is what I would suggest to you, Steve. In order to execute this, I've only known very large companies that have it. So I would say you should talk to a pension consultant. Here's the great news for you, Steve. I got one for you on Long Island. And he's a pension and benefits consultant. So I'm going to have Mark send this to you and I'm going to send you the name of the benefit person who I know that happens to be sitting in your neighborhood. Unfortunately for everybody else out there, I happen to know this one person and it's in this guy's neighborhood. I don't know if I can do that for all of you. But um, what I want to point out is that if you are an employer and you're talking about a different strategy for your retirement assets, What I would suggest is getting a consultant who does retirement plans specifically. A lot of these people deal with small companies because the owners are trying to seek ways to get more and more money into a retirement plan. So that's what I would tell you. All right. So stand by, Steve. I'll make sure that we get you some more information. Whew. That was long. Uh, 
Okay. This is a question from Diane, 79 years old. I own a little home. I've got $20,000 in a checking account. I've got a couple sons, one married with children, one never married. And um, the let's see, wants to know, can I gift $15,000 um, to my son? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Um, the question is, you know, it looks like you've got some money in retirement. What you should be doing is not depleting your own money that you may need to gift to your son. You can gift $15,000 to anybody. doesn't have to be a relation at any point in your life each year. So you can do it, but I want you to be careful not to deplete yourself of what that beautiful liquidity could mean to you in the future. All right? Very important. All right, you're listening to Jill on Money. When we return, we're going to get back to more of your questions. How about during the break, you do something really smart? Go to JillOnMoney.com and buy my book. It's the dumb things smart people do with their money. 13 ways to right your financial wrongs. Isn't that a good way to start the year? Get going. It's right there. Jill on Money. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. I love Policy Genius, Mark. Remember Jennifer Fitzgerald, CEO? Liked her. Great interview. We interviewed her, and then all of a sudden, boom, they pop up as a sponsor of the show. That was not a quid pro quo, I might tell you. It happened very randomly. So kind of fun. Anyway, Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com and you can learn a little bit more about that what they got. Barry writes, he's just retiring from a civil service job. I'm enrolled in an employer sponsored 457. I am also retired from the Air Force. Wow. I'm 62 and many people I spoke to said I should be taking my social security. Why? I want to withdraw from my 457 plan until I'm six, I'm till I am 66 and a half and then I would start taking my social security. I don't see any reason not to withdraw from my 457 first and then start social security. Right, I agree with you. Uh, I, a lot of people who take at 62, I, I don't you didn't say that you have a spouse or not, but uh, I I mean, look, if you're in poor health and you really don't think you're going to live till you're I don't know, 78 or so, then yeah, okay, take your social security early. But uh, I agree with you. There's no real reason why you shouldn't wait till your full retirement age and get the money and that's it. And it seems to me that that's a fantastic game plan. And if you have any, if there's anything else I'm not seeing here that would, you know, change that, I don't know, maybe fill in some blanks. But, um, you know, look, the best thing to do if you're going to execute that particular strategy would be to build up some of your non-retirement assets. So maybe um, for those of you thinking about that, before you retire, start gathering up some moolah to float you until your full retirement age. But generally speaking, full retirement age is really what we recommend most. All right, that is it. That is the program. Thanks so much for listening. If you have questions throughout the week, all you have to do is send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com or hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, and there's a contact button. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. If not, we'll talk to you next week. Have a great week.